Hi everyone, this is Religiolog, and in this video I analyze the social status of non-believers in the United States. I focus on 10 areas where non-believers in the US might experience various prejudices and discrimination. Of course, it's not limited only to these 10 areas, but you know, 10 is simply a good number, so I'll focus on 10 areas where discrimination is the most obvious. Before we get into the first out of 10 areas, let me explain that many Americans have various prejudices against those who don't believe in God or supernatural powers. They are often perceived as morally inferior and unworthy of trust. As a result, the phenomenon of atheophobia is widespread in the US. I'm not sure if you ever heard of such thing, but atheophobia is the fear and or hatred of atheists or atheism. Robert Nash, philosophy of education professor, defines atheophobia as the fear and loathing of atheists that permeates American culture. Often atheophobes treat all atheists or non-believers as if they all think and behave in the same way. In Discrimination Against Atheists, Nina Whaler Harwell argues that atheists are not afforded the same level of tolerance and freedom of conscience that is granted to God-believing citizens of the United States. She claims that even though America proudly stands for religious freedom, atheists in 21st century America experience a level of marginalization that cannot be compared with God-believers. The idea that atheists are immoral or amoral, or that atheism necessarily leads to moral degradation, is an age-old prejudice. In Battling the Gods, Tim Whitmarsh demonstrates that ancient historical records suggest that atheism is as natural to humans as religion. In addition, the idea of atheophobia goes at least as far back as Plato, who in his 10th book of the Dialogue on Laws advocated draconian measures against atheists and people we would call deists. Plato's recommended punishment for atheists was death. At best, he believed that such people must be isolated from society. The philosopher considered non-believers to be possessed by disease and regarded them as state criminals, who would provoke societal disturbance if left unchecked. In her article, Atheophobia in the History of Christianity and Three Thought, Religious scholar Zulfiata Jurizina from Moscow State University links the development of atheophobic ideas to Judeo-Christian times. She provides many historical examples that mainly came from Christian church fathers and theologians. Today some research suggests that non-believers are one of the most distrusted minority groups in the US, as well as the world. Uh, Cornell University historians Maureen Kramnik claim atheists remain the most disliked religious minority in America. As mentioned above, one of the most serious biases against non-believers is that they are ethically inferior. The equation is simple. If in the minds of many people religion is associated with morality, then irreligion is automatically associated with immorality. Based on this prejudice, many other related misunderstandings can take root. For example, the discrimination and hardships that non-believers face when they try to run for office, get a job, obtain child custody, create an organization or club, advertise their worldview, be trusted by their peers, provide witness testimony in court, or serve on a jury. In What It Means to Be Moral, Zuckerman cites the most popular evangelical pastor Rick Warren and Rabbi Shmuley Botich, uh, who the Washington Post deemed as the most famous rabbi in America, as associating atheism with immorality. Same thing can be said about many American politicians. For example, former vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin declared that the logical result of atheism is severe moral decay. Jeff Sessions, President Trump's first attorney general, publicly proclaimed that secular people are incompatible of knowing truth, for without God there is no truth. Zuckerman continues with many other examples, including U.S. Attorney General Matt Whitaker, uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Antonin Scalia, Governor of Ohio John Kasich, and many others who are convinced that a person cannot be ethical or moral without belief in God. According to 2013 International Pew Survey, 53% of Americans, 70% of Indians, 86% of Brazilians, 93% of Filipinos, and 95% of Egyptians believe that it is necessary to believe in God in order to be moral. At the same time, social science evidence clearly refutes this mistaken claim. All this creates a climate in which being or becoming an open non-believer is extremely difficult and dangerous. 
In the US in particular, atheists are treated by many as second-class citizens. Many consider them to be lesser Americans, or atheism is treated as if it is un-American. A nationally representative survey in the US found that 41% of atheists reported experiencing discrimination in the previous five years as a result of their lack of religious identification. But more in Kramnik, in their godly citizens in a godly republic, atheist and American public life, indicate. Unable to chip away at the omnipresence of God in official political discourse, non-believers are marginalized, even stigmatized as well by their fellow citizens. This was true in the past, and it remains true. No surprise then that candidates for public office would be silent about non-belief. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that non-believers in the United States occasionally face serious discrimination. Consider the 2008 case in Illinois, when atheist Rob Sherman and his daughter filed a lawsuit to stop the mandatory moment of silence for a silent thought or prayer, to which Representative Monique Davis uh, responded, This is the land of Lincoln, where people believe in God, where people believe in protecting their children. What you have to spew and spread is extremely dangerous. It's dangerous for our children to even know that your philosophy exists. You believe in destroying what this state was built upon. This way, according to Representative Davis, atheism is destroying the state. As Eric Zarn of the Chicago Tribune puts it, consider what the atrocity would have been if a lawmaker had launched a similar attack on the belief of a religious person. Just imagine that instead of Sherman, a representative of the Jewish, Sikh or Shinto religion was told, what you have to spew and spread is extremely dangerous. It's dangerous for our children to even know that your philosophy exists. How does that sound? Why does someone have to be religious? And why do they have to teach their children to be religious? Who has a right to make such decisions? So this video will explore some of such cases in order to identify status of non-believers in America today, as well as the challenges and hardships that they face. Melanie Brewster, Associate Professor of Psychology and Education at Columbia University, researches marginalized groups and examines how experiences of discrimination and stigma may shape the mental health of minority group members, for example, LGBTQI individuals, atheists, or people of color. Her book, Atheist in America, begins to debunk the myth that atheophobia is restricted only to the Bible Belt. When describing her personal story, uh, Brewster mentions how she suddenly realized how stigmatized atheists are in the United States. This stigma runs so deep that even in a large public university amongst psychology doctoral students, who are, by the way, notoriously liberal and open-minded, it was completely acceptable to believe that being nice and being atheist were mutually exclusive identities to hold. She reminds readers that the prevalence of these atheophobic and negative attitudes shapes atheist experiences. As a result, atheists report significant discrimination in schools, at their places of employment, between the legal system, and in many other settings. In our non-Christian nations, how atheists, Satanists, pagans, and others are demanding their rightful place in public life, Jay Wexler of Boston University shows how non-Christians and non-believers demand full participation in public life, bringing their arguments all the way to the Supreme Court. He points out that despite the law being on their side, their attempts are met with suspicion and outright hostility. More in Kramnik state that a long list of overt officially sanctioned historical discrimination against atheists and non-believers has resulted from their being so unlike and mistrusted. Well, into the 20th century, some localities have prohibited them from testifying in court, since it was assumed that their lack of fear of eternal damnation diminished their ability to tell the truth. In other cases, atheists have been prohibited from serving on juries. Even though there are many more categories and areas in which the rights of non-believers are violated and where stigma against them prevail, I will focus on the 10 most obvious and most discussed areas where non-believers are treated unjustly. They are as follows. Uh, military, education, employment, politics, blasphemy, child custody, boy scouts, media, marriage, and social exclusion. So let's begin with military or chaplaincy. After investigating a number of complaints, in 2005 at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, American United for Separation of Church and State concluded the following. 
specific constitutional violations and the promotion of a culture of official religious intolerance are pervasive, systematic and evident at the very highest levels of the academy's command structure. According to the report, the school demonstrated hostility toward those who do not subscribe to and practice evangelical Christianity. Moore and Kramnik stated, Numerous examples of discrimination against non-believers have been exposed in the military. They remind that on April 26, 2008, the New York Times reported that one soldier claimed that he was discharged for his atheism. Similarly, David Niosa notes that secular Americans routinely face overt discrimination in the military, where God and religiosity are important aspects of the warrior culture. At the same time, he agrees that in recent years secular soldiers have been pushing back with some success. Niosa grants a large portion of such success to the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers and the Military Religious Freedom Foundation two groups that are fighting back against discriminatory treatment of secular soldiers. Their official websites present various cases of violations or biases that caused unjust treatment of non-believers in the US military. Together with that, MRFF defends all aspects of religious freedom, including the rights of Muslims, Jews, and other minority religious groups, mostly because of the pervasive conservative Christian bias within the military. One of the highest priorities of MAAF has been a campaign to allow humanist chaplains in the military. While about 23% of the general military population affirm not having a religious preference, according to MAAF, about 97% of over 3,000 chaplains in the military are Christian, with only about 69% of Christians among the general military population. Now let's discuss schools. The Freedom From Religion Foundation reports that they receive nearly 5,000 complaints annually on the issues of church and state violations. According to Elizabeth Cavell, uh, attorney and associate counsel at FFRF, almost half of them are related to violations in schools. In the 1960s, 59% of Americans agreed that those who did not believe in God should not be able to teach in public schools. In the 1980s, however, only 24% still believe that. And yet, in 2003 and 2009, there were news stories about employers uh, terminating atheist employees. For example, the Middlebury School Board in Indiana fired Kevin Pack, a former German teacher, in 2014 for being an atheist. Another case shows how an atheist teacher was fired over refusal to conduct a religious assembly in school. Also in their works, uh, Wexler and Niose discuss many cases of law violations in public schools. For example, in 2008, Louisiana passed a law allowing fundamentalist public school science teachers to use supplemental materials in their classrooms. It gives teachers license to equate creationism with evolution and open the way for Bible-based creationism to enter the curricula. The Washington Post reported that even though over 40 Nobel Prize winning scientists opposed the law, Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal and conservative Christian groups insisted that it promoted critical thinking. According to the Freedom of Thought Report 2020, despite the clear prohibition against public funding for religious schools, there are some cases where state and federal funding can be used to send children to private religious schools through a voucher program. The report explains how governmental funds through the CARES Act of 2020 and aid package in response to COVID-19 can be used to support private religious institutions. Number 3. Employment If based on the University of British Columbia study conducted in the US, believers distrust atheists as much they do rapists, then it is no surprise that, as the same study also shows, atheists have lower employment prospects. Another report suggests that this is especially relevant for atheists who are residents of very religious communities. American atheists also reported employment discrimination in the name of religion in 2019. Surveys showed that respondents to a large degree preferred religious candidates for jobs that were considered high trust, while they marginally preferred non-believers for low trust jobs like servers. Of course, in uh, many cases, it is harder to identify someone's religious belief uh, comparing to, let's say, their race or gender identity. And this makes their experience quite different from racial or sexual discrimination. Therefore, these authors in the Journal of Counseling Psychology agree that atheists would prefer to hide their personal religious views. 
Various cases also reveal that if their non-believing identity is discovered after they are hired, they can also face discrimination, including losing their job. Two prime examples are Richard Mullins in 2009 in Texas and Abby Nuri in 2010 in Iowa, both of whom are teachers. David Niose, for instance, reports on the resignation of Captain and Academy Chaplain Melinda Morton from the US Air Force after she was removed from her administrative post at the Academy. The Freedom of Thought report states that in August 2019, the Trump administration also announced a proposal which would extend to for-profit companies whose owners claim to follow religious belief, the right, currently granted exclusively to non-profit religious organizations, to enter into contracts with the federal government with the exemption from the requirement to not discriminate in employment on the basis of religion. Let's move forward uh, to politics or exclusion from office. The question on employment uh, brings us to the question of trusting atheists in their attempt to run for office. Back in 2017, HuffPost claimed, there isn't a single admitted atheist currently in Congress. Moreover, there are only very few atheists in all the state legislatures uh, across the nation. The report calls non-belief a political poison for American politicians. Another report indicates that nor has there ever been an openly atheist president, vice president, governor, Supreme Court justice or member of the president's cabinet. In fact, despite constitutional restrictions on religious tests for holding public office, the constitutions of eight US states ban atheists from holding public office. You can read them, it's kind of fun, but let me just read a couple of them. Article 19, Constitution of Arkansas. No person who denies the being of a god shall hold any office in the civil departments of this state, nor be competent to testify as a witness in any court. Article 17, Constitution of South Carolina. No person who denies the existence of supreme being shall hold any office under this constitution. Please note that the Tarkasa v. Watkins uh, decision makes these laws technically not effective. The report in Legal Times from 2006 indicated that due to the striking prejudice against atheists, they are almost totally absent from political office, even as compared with other relatively unpopular groups. The report states that despite significant antagonism toward homosexuals, there are currently three openly gay members of Congress, including a conservative Republican. Similarly, there are currently 26 Jewish congressmen and 11 Jewish senators. Yet, there is not even one openly atheist member of Congress. Uh, remember, it's 2006. Since 1958, Gallup began asking the questions about atheist candidates. A poll taken during the 2012 election season found that only 54% of Americans would vote for a well-qualified atheist presidential candidate. These numbers are much better compared to previous decades, however, atheism still is the highest damaging influence on a hypothetical candidate's uh, viability. More respondents prefer either a gay or a Muslim candidate and would not be willing to vote for an atheist. Of course, we must take into consideration that respondents were limited to the choices provided in the poll. If, let's say, there will be transgender women of color or some other minority groups, then the result of the poll might be different. Anyway, despite this prejudice, or perhaps it would be correct to say due to the fact, representatives uh, Jared Huffman, uh, Jamie Ruskin, Jerry McNerney and Dan Kildee founded the Congregational Three Thought Caucus in 2018. Its goal is to promote policy solutions based on reason and science and defend the secular character of government and oppose discrimination against atheists, agnostics, humanists, religious and non-religious persons and to champion the value of freedom of thought and conscience worldwide. As of 2019, Representative Jared Huffman is the only openly non-theist elected official serving at the federal level. In 2014, though, the American Humanist Association uh, claimed that dozens of politicians in Congress privately admitted that they are non-religious, but are afraid to come out. Moving to number 5. Blasphemy. Uh, Andrew Seidel, a constitutional attorney and the director of strategic response at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, uh, reports on the case when George Kalman wanted to name his film company I Choose Hell Productions. Seidel states that Kalman's choice was rejected by Pennsylvania because corporation names were not allowed to be blasphemous. 
Uh, however, in 2010, the court held that the blasphemy statute violated uh, both the establishment and free speech clauses of the First Amendment. At the same time, several states still have blasphemy statutes on the books. Of course, if someone tried to enforce them, they would probably face a constitutional challenge. Uh, still, the fact that such statutes uh, remain on the books is problematic and unconstitutional. Let me read at least one of them. Massachusetts. Whoever willfully blasphemes the holy name of God by denying, cursing, or... Wow, I'll skip this word. Contumelously? Anyway, yeah, let me please, let me skip this word. So, whoever willfully blasphemes the holy name of God by denying, cursing, or reproaching God, uh, his creation, government, or final judging of the world, or by cursing Jesus Christ or the Holy Ghost, or by cursing or exposing to contempt and ridicule the holy word of God contained in the holy scriptures, shall be punished by imprisonment in jail for not more than one year or by a fine of no more than $300, and may also be bound to good behavior. Moving to number 6, child custody. If atheists cannot be trusted to be good employees, uh, politicians, teachers, or soldiers, they undoubtedly cannot be trusted to be reliable parents. Reports demonstrate that courts in some states routinely discriminate against non-believers in child custody battles. Ilya Somin, a law professor at George Mason University, shows that there are many documented cases of judges simply denying parents' custody rights uh, because they have no interest in religion. He draws from UCLA law professor Eugene Voloch, who documented numerous instances where atheist parents or even relatively non-observant theists lose out in child custody disputes because of judicial bias. Judges explicitly stated in published opinions that they favored the parent who was more observant or provided more religious training to the child. Moore and Kramnik name cases in Pennsylvania, South Carolina, and Mississippi courts and note that all of them made child custody decisions specifically to the detriment of the non-believing parent. On some occasions, an atheist parent is ordered to attend church so that their children can undergo systematic spiritual training. Such an attitude is obvious discrimination, since it entails a state endorsement of one religious belief as superior to another. Moreover, it is important to remember that there may be many cases in which analogous prejudice were not documented, but yet influenced the outcome of the case. The category number 7 is Boy Scouts. Nearly every author who writes on the matter of discrimination against non-believers in the US mentions the blatant discrimination by the Boy Scouts of America. For example, Lee Eric Schmidt starts his Village Atheist, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way Into a Godly Nation, by stating that in the very DNA of the organization is the assumption that every Boy Scout needs to have a religious faith in order to belong to the group and be a model citizen. As the association's guidelines declare, no member can grow into the best kind of citizen without recognizing an obligation to God. Schmidt reminds the reader that when the BSA lifted its ban on gay scouts leaders in July 2015, after years of dispute, progressives saw it as one more step forward in the struggle against discrimination. Secular activists, however, were quick to remind the Boy Scouts of its other membership employment and leadership ban. In 2009, Eagle Scout Neil Polzin was fired from his job as an aquatic director at a Boy Scout camp after his role with a secular student group was uncovered. Trying to rationalize such policies, Neosa mentions that the BSA has lost uh, much of its corporate and charitable support due to its discrimination controversies, including the funding of about 50 local United Ways and corporations such as Hewlett-Packard, IBM, Levi-Strauss, and CVS Pharmacies. Despite this, uh, national BSA leadership, which is greatly influenced by conservative religious groups, stubbornly resists change. For example, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or Mormons, currently one of the largest sponsors of BSA units, has stated that it will withdraw from the BSA if it is forced to accept gays. Number 8. Freedom of expression, media or advertisement. When Richard Semina and Christopher Smith conducted their research on non-believers, their respondents noted that atheism still faces media discrimination. 
Some respondents agreed that atheism has always been cast in the lowest regard by the media and most everyone in America. According to HuffPost, federal judge Susan Weber Wright uh, ruled in 2011 that the Central Arkansas Transit Authority violated the free speech rights of a local atheist group when it denied the group's request to launch an ad uh, campaign on city buses. Religious ads have been regularly approved by the ad organization that worked with the Transit Authority. Before that, religious ads had been regularly approved by the ad organization that worked with the Transit Authority. This is just one example among many. The article states that on some occasions, simple requests by secular groups to run an ad that included the word atheist led a town to change its entire advertising policy, banning all religious-based content. It is also important to mention that in some cases, when advertising agencies have allowed atheists to purchase ad space, it has led to vandalism. In our non-Christian nation, Jay Wexler shared a number of cases in which secular groups faced opposition when attempting to express their opinion publicly. Groups such as the Satanic Temple, the United Church of Bacon, and the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster make light of religion to demonstrate the absurdity of some laws and regulations that discriminate against religious minorities and secular people. Such secular or parodic religious groups occasionally show their disagreement with prayers and invocations before local council meetings by reading their secular invocations. Some of them evoke a protest or scandal. For example, on February 11, 2019, Representative Athena Salman, an openly atheist lawmaker, delivered a secular and inclusive invocation to start a state of Arizona legislative session. You can find all this stuff on YouTube. Afterward, Republican State Representative John Cavana mocked Salmon's invocation by introducing his special guest, God. In July 2016, when David Suhor led a satanic invocation at a city council meeting in Pensacola, Florida, he was met with strong opposition. But for us, it's important to understand what motivates people like Suhor, Salman, or Pastor Barrett Fletcher of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, who gave a similar invocation in Alaska, to commit such acts of rebellion. What message are they trying to convey? Okay, let's move to number 9. Marriages. Just as the Satanic Temple mimics religion, many avowedly secular people have assumed a strategic religious identity in order to achieve a desired non-religious ritual in an individualized manner. The problem is that many states don't allow secular celebrants who are certified by non-believer organizations to solemnize marriages. Most states don't legally recognize such weddings. As a result, non-religious couples find alternatives that facilitate such rituals even paradoxically yet pragmatically by utilizing a religious resource such as the Universal Life Church. I hope you know the story behind Universal Life Church and how you can easily obtain the certificate from them, but I won't go into details. However, uh, some secular organizations refuse to utilize such tools, viewing it as an assault to their dignity. Why do they have to play such games with the law and pretend to be religious uh, when they are not? Therefore, the Center for Inquiry, one of the leading secular organizations in the US, demands that non-religious celebrants be treated equally to religious celebrants with regard to solemnizing marriages. CFI went to the court in many states demanding that their celebrants who go through special training be legally recognized. The organization has several ongoing cases. It was successful in Indiana and Illinois, but lost its case in Texas. For example, the CFI website states, In a milestone victory for non-religious Americans, a U.S. District Court judge ruled today that certified secular celebrants are now authorized to solemnize marriages in the state of Illinois. In the suit brought by the Center for Inquiry, excluding secular celebrants from the list of those authorized to solemnize marriages was declared unconstitutional. And finally, number 10, social exclusion. A 2012 survey found that half of Americans believed that atheism was threatening to them. As previously mentioned, the study conducted by the University of British Columbia and the University of Oregon found that believers distrust atheists as much as they do rapists. Thus, it shouldn't come as a surprise that non-believers in America often feel socially isolated. They are not respected by their leaders or neighbors. As a result, there are organizations with an anyone but atheist membership policy. Uh, I already mentioned that the Boy Scouts of America openly reject atheists while accepting members of any and all religions. 
the Veterans of Foreign Wars, a leading veteran group in the US, revoked a similar ban on atheists only in 2004. In non-religious, understanding secular people and society, Zuckerman state, There is a long-standing view in Western history that religion is essential to the social character and coherence of societies. Religion is, as Edmund Burke asserted, the basis of civil society. In this view, secularity is a threat to social cohesion or solidarity, for among other things, the non-religious are substantially asocial. A study by Penny Agile and others, atheists and other cultural outsiders, concludes a substantial percentage of Americans see atheists as immoral and are therefore significantly more likely to say that atheists do not share their vision of America and to disprove of their son or daughter marrying an atheist. Brewster shares finding of her studies in which several thousand atheists were asked to recall how frequently they felt they were treated as if, if they were immoral, ostracized, made to feel ashamed, or asked to conceal their atheism. She concluded, we found that the more participants experience uh, this atheophobic maltreatment, the higher their levels of psychological distress and social isolation were. Thus, experiencing stigma for being atheist has real ramifications for mental health. A 2020 report, Being Non-Religious in America, supports these findings. Another example of social exclusion is the creation of social organizations or clubs. Various groups of non-believers have uh, regularly been denied the opportunity to form uh, recognized clubs at public schools around the nation. A HuffPost article states that such challenges are not universal, but they are common, and they come in different forms. Sometimes applications from secular groups are rejected, or official club status is denied. Other times, administrators simply create too many procedural obstacles to discourage the idea of forming a club. One more group of people who might feel socially isolated due to their non-belief are former or currently religious leaders who have lost their faith in supernatural. For this type of people, the Clergy Project was launched in 2011. It provides peer support to current and former religious leaders who claim they no longer have faith. Currently, they have over 1,200 participants. It is hard to find another profession that is so difficult to leave and that causes so much trauma as that of the clergy. When a person changes careers, other than the clergy, it doesn't normally result in losing uh, most of their friends, most of their support system, and sometimes even their family. But TCP participants uh, show that this is exactly what often happens to ex-clergy. Their testimonies, uh, some of which are recorded on their blogs and in their books, reveal various hardships and consequences that accompany their change in belief and it can be catastrophic. Many of them have lost their social capital and reputation that they accumulated over the course of their entire life. Their spouse, children, family members, friends and colleagues may turn away from them just because of their apostasy. The study described in Dennett and Lascola's Caught in the Pulpit reveals how this phenomenon has serious consequences not only for clergy but also for their families. The loss of social capital can often lead to anxiety and depression. Indeed, the social exclusion of atheists uh, varies greatly from place to place and is very difficult to measure. However, in many parts of the world, atheists still have to hide their views to avoid hostility in situations where believers feel perfectly free to express their own views. While closeted atheists arguably don't suffer as much as closeted homosexuals do, but it doesn't mean they don't experience any pain. Just imagine a situation when religious believers had to hide their own religious beliefs to avoid ostracism. As a result of discrimination, apostates are often rejected by their former congregation and even family members after coming out. Anticipating this kind of hardships, uh, many prefer to be closeted non-believers. They live a double life in order to maintain their social capital. Thus, maybe Robert Nash was right when he defined atheophobia as the fear and laughing of atheists that permeates American culture. Many Americans still find it hard to accept non-believers as part of their extended family or as co-citizens, neighbors, peers, friends, relatives, politicians, educators, juries, chaplains, etc. Also, many Americans treat non-believers as not being worthy of trust and, as mentioned earlier, as lesser Americans or unpatriotic and even un-American. 
One psychological study suggests that atheophobia is mainly driven by distrust more than other factors. For instance, while homophobia is often driven by disgust, atheophobia is motivated by distrust to a degree that atheists are treated the same as violent criminals such as rapists. Another study carried out by the psychology department of Nottingham Trent University established that people's distrust of atheists is deeply and culturally ingrained. The study found widespread prejudice against atheists and concluded Anti-atheist prejudice is not confined either to dominantly religious countries or to religious individuals, but rather appears to be a robust judgment about atheists. But many studies have shown that the depiction of non-religious population as immoral is not objective. On many occasions the ethics and morals of non-religious people could be even higher than those of religious people. Studies also demonstrate that the unaffiliated and non-believers tend to display high degree of support for gender equality, egalitarianism and women's rights and are less likely to endorse traditional gender roles, example negative use of women working outside the home. A study by Semina and Smith also concludes that the prejudice atheists as a social group face in the United States tend to be more of an institutional or structural sort than of an individual or explicitly discriminatory or violent sort. Although there have been cases of more individual and violent incidents, with atheists receiving death threats, getting kicked out of apartments and losing their jobs. But don't get me wrong, it would be extremely presumptuous to claim that atheists in America today face an enormous amount of discrimination on a personal level. Many sexual, ethnic or racial minority groups suffer much more. But the level of distrust toward non-believers uh, causes a fair amount of related biases that don't allow atheists to be open about their disbelief in many parts of the country. As Melanie Brewster states, the problem with prejudicial views and stigma, however, is that these beliefs motivate behavior, thus atheists experience both interpersonal discrimination, slander, social ostracism, coercion, verbal attacks, violence, property damage, and structural discrimination, denial of opportunities, goods and services by those who hold atheophobia. The idea that atheists are immoral people who cause disturbance and even destruction has become an almost commonsensical worldview. This distrust is so universal and robust in today's world that even those who are actively harmed by this kind of thought process will support it. Indeed, psychologists at Nottingham Trent University found that even atheists often do not trust other atheists. The data, however, shows that such a high level of distrust in non-believers is unreasonable. Social scientific data demonstrate that non-believers are no more immoral than religious individuals. Also, these authors demonstrate that the problem is not just prejudice among individuals. Naturally, atheists cannot attain political office, legislative and governmental system also reject non-believers. As Semina and Smith notes, in the wake of the civil rights movement, many new groups, from feminists to gays to religious fundamentalists, have taken up the discourse of identities to struggle for equity and recognition in the political arena. Atheists are following suit in their claim that they are embattled minority in need of rights and even protection in a religious and hostile society, tacitly acknowledging the failure of widespread secularism. And today we are witnessing how various secular groups in America, uh, some of the most prominent among them are Freedom from Religion Foundation, American Humanist Association, Secular Student Alliance, Center for Inquiry, uh, are engaging in greater activism to protect secular rights. In recent years, several organizations, uh, such as the Atheism Anti-Discrimination Support Network, have formed to encounter discrimination and build a political identity. Nowadays, the secular movement is unified under the umbrella of Secular Coalition for America, which includes the major national secular organizations. Uh, finally, atheophobia is a complex and multi-phase phenomenon that comes in various forms and is supported by many factors. But it is important to remember that there are many people who are victims of this phenomenon. People often fear what they don't know. This is true in the case of Islamophobia or homophobia, this is also true in the case of atheophobia. Therefore, it is important to obtain knowledge about secular people. The secular studies need to be taken more seriously. It's no surprise that non-believers are so misunderstood and stigmatized. One of the main problems is illiteracy or ignorance about non-believers. 
about who they are, what is in their mind, and what a secular worldview, secular values, and secular lifestyle really means to them. Most of them are not associated with any organizations. They don't even think about religion, they are not involved in any kind of activism, and yet they have to suffer. We need to understand what makes people so biased against non-believers. Why do some people feel attacked by secular ideas? Why do they feel afraid and experience these ideas as an existential threat to them? Why do they think that they will turn into some evil criminal if they embrace such ideas? All of these questions need to be addressed and studied. Unfortunately, the secular population is a significant but understudied minority group. According to Melanie Brewster, about 480,000 peer-reviewed articles related to religiosity or spirituality were published in the field of psychology in the last 30 years. But only about 100 articles related to atheism were published from 2001 to 2012. Based on this discovery, she concludes that as a field, psychology has still said almost nothing about atheists. It is crucially important for scholars of religion to recognize that while they help to increase religious literacy in order to mitigate religiophobia among non-believers and competing religious groups, there is another important dimension that is often forgotten or simply ignored – groups of non-believers or secular people who may represent just the tip of the iceberg. In addition to understanding different types of secular people, it is also important to study different layers of discrimination against atheists, as they diverge for people of different genders, races, cultural or religious backgrounds, as well as according to social status, level of education, and other factors. Some studies already demonstrate this. For example, some scholars show what specific challenges African Americans face in the US. Others focus on the hardships of working class and low-income atheists. Likewise, we need more understanding of both secular and anti-secular activism. While the new atheist movement is a relatively recent phenomenon, anti-secular rhetoric and distrust toward non-believers have always been present in the US. Uh, Jay Wexler, similar to Simeon Smith and Moran Kramnik, demonstrate that because the Supreme Court has undermined the Establishment Clause in a variety of recent cases, allowing religion to participate in public life and take advantage of government money, government institutions, or government property, secular groups have to become more active. At the same time that the Supreme Court has increasingly allowed Christianity and religion to enter into the public life, fewer and fewer people have identified as being Christian or religious. As a result, atheists and other religious minorities, who would normally stay out of public life, feel forced by the actions of state institutions to change their behavior in order to participate in public life alongside Christians. The rise of the Christian right at least partially gave rise to the atheist awakening. As a result, at the beginning of the 21st century, we are witnessing the rise of the secular movement and nuns, non-affiliated, and a decline in church goers, especially among the younger population. The fact that, according to the American Religious Identification Survey, more than a quarter of Americans expect non-religious funerals for themselves, speaks to the silence of this matter. Just imagine, a quarter of Americans don't want their funerals to have a religious component. This means that there is a big demand for non-religious rites of passage. More and more couples want to have a secular weddings as well. Ronald Inglehart, in his Religion Sudden Decline, argues that in the last 14 years, the United States has been secularizing more rapidly than any other country for which they had data. Its level has fallen substantially by virtually every measure of religiosity. And if this is the real America today, then atheists are not asking to change reality. It already has changed. They are not asking to change someone's religious views, but simply their prejudice. They are simply asking to adjust the law of the land, to recognize the new reality, and to accept them as people who deserve to be treated equally and with dignity.